Okay, I think we're ready now to explore the chemical senses, beginning with the sense of olfaction. As I've already told you, this aspect of our consideration of the chemical senses will reveal again the complexity of the human brain and will provide us an opportunity to explore some really fabulous circuitry that connects the sensory periphery in the olfactory system to the brain. And I think you'll be surprised with some aspects of the specificity of that relationship that reflects genetic instructions that are played out both in, in brain space and in time as the nervous system develops. And all of this is critical for the foundation of the olfactory sense. So my learning objectives for you in this session, in this part of our tutorial, are really threefold. I'd like for you to be able to characterize the peripheral and central organization of the olfactory system. I'd like for you to again focus on this critical issue of sensory transduction that's been central to all of our considerations of sensation so far in the course. And I'd like for you to get a feel for how information is actually encoded in the olfactory system. I think one of the values in studying the chemical senses is that we discover uh, perhaps some surprising means for coding information in a sensory system that, um, especially in olfaction, seem to be quite different than the kinds of uh, coding mechanisms that we've seen so far in somatic sensation, in vision, and even in audition. All right, well, let's begin with an anatomical overview of the olfactory system. So as I've already mentioned to you, uh, olfaction uh, begins with airborne molecules interacting with receptors. And those receptors are found in our olfactory epithelium. And our olfactory epithelium is found in the uh, dorsal and medial aspect of our nasal passageway. And it's there that we find our receptor cells. We'll have a closer look at those receptor cells in just a little bit, but for now I just want to place them for you. So our olfactory epithelium then is where sensory transduction occurs. So our sensory cells then are found within our olfactory epithelium, which is shown at a little bit higher magnification here to the right. And these cells uh, grow an axon that passes through perforations in the ethmoid bone and we call uh, this region of the ethmoid bone the cribiform plate. And these axons enter a part of the brain called the olfactory bulb. And there they make synaptic connections with neurons that are in the bulb and are actually part of the brain. Now, if you remember what the ventral surface of the brain looks like from our tutorials where I showed you the actual human brain specimen, you might assume that the olfactory bulb and this this long connection is actually a cranial nerve. Well, it's not. The olfactory bulb is part of the brain. The cranial nerve that we associate with olfaction represents these axons that pass through the cribriform plate. So this is our first cranial nerve, cranial nerve one. It's the axons of the primary sensory neurons that have a cell body in the olfactory epithelium and grow an axon through the cribriform plate to make synaptic connection in the olfactory bulb. This long extension then that connects the olfactory bulb backward toward the brain, uh, this is called the lateral olfactory tract. So again, not a nerve, but an extension of the brain. The cells in the olfactory bulb that grow the axons that form this lateral olfactory tract they are called mitral cells. We'll talk more about that in a little while, but for now I'll just mention that the mitral cells are then the principal projection cells that connect the olfactory bulb to the rest of the brain. And as we'll see, uh, these structures in the brain are part of what we call the olfactory cortex. Okay, so here more schematically, uh, we have our olfactory epithelium here, which is where we find our olfactory receptors. The first cranial nerve connects those receptor neurons to mitral cells in the olfactory bulb. And there are other cells as well that we'll talk about when we look in more detail at the uh, cellular structure of the olfactory bulb. So the axons of the mitral cells project through the lateral olfactory tract 
to a series of targets that are found in the ventral and medial aspects of the forebrain. Now collectively we call these targets the olfactory cortex. Some of these structures are uh, quite prominent and clearly are cortical in nature, such as the piriform cortex. Uh, here we're spelling it with a Y. You'll notice in my handout I spell it with an, with an I, P, I, R, I. You'll see spellings both ways, so uh, either spelling is acceptable. Don't worry about that. Uh, another major cortical structure uh, that is clearly laminated and recognizable as cortex is the interrhinal cortex. So this is cortex a little bit more posterior back on the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. It's part of what we call the hippocampal formation. Now, these two other components, the olfactory tubercle and the amygdala, uh, these are structures that we consider to be corticoid structures. And so this is simply a way of saying, well, they are derived from the same kind of embryological tissue that form the beautiful laminated cortex. However, the organization of the cells is not quite so clearly laminar. So from that perspective, we call this corticoid. Now I should emphasize that each of these divisions of the olfactory cortex are heavily interconnected with one another. While sometimes we tend to focus on the piriform cortex, really it's this entire extended network of cells that constitute our olfactory cortex. Well, in addition to intrinsic associational connections, these divisions of the olfactory cortex also have projections to other parts of the brain. And this includes the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and especially important is the orbital and frontal parts of the prefrontal cortex, that is the part of the frontal lobe that sits just above the orbits of the eyes. As we'll come to discuss as we move along through this set of tutorials, it's here in the orbital frontal cortex that information from all of our chemosensory systems is combined with somatic sensation and, and even visual sensations. And it's in this part of the brain that our concept of flavor appears to be represented, as well as a sense of the rewarding value of food. Now, of course, in addition, food can be a powerful trigger for memory and for recall. So uh, it makes sense that the entorhinal cortex has direct access to the circuitry of the hippocampal formation where new declarative memories are formed. Now let's look at these brain regions from an anatomical perspective and I'll go ahead and show you my brain model uh, just to remind you in a bit more realistic fashion uh, what we're actually looking at here. So I think you can recognize nicely the olfactory bulb and the lateral olfactory tract that connects the olfactory bulb back to the olfactory cortex. And even in this brain model, as you may remember from looking at the actual human brain, it does look like a nerve, but again, I would emphasize that the olfactory bulb is really part of the human brain. Well, the lateral olfactory tract then connects back to the inferior and posterior part of the frontal lobe right near the junction of the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. That's where we find the beginnings of our olfactory cortex. Well now, to look at our figure from our textbook, that cortex is illustrated here in the green shade. And the first division that we encounter of that cortex is the olfactory tubercle. So this is really a ventral part of the striatum. So it sits just below uh, the main bulk of the basal ganglia. We'll get to talk about that in the next unit, but just to help you localize this region, it's uh, just dorsal and a bit anterior to the level of the optic chiasm, which we see right here on the ventral aspect of the brain. Well, the rest of the olfactory cortex flows into the medial part of the temporal lobe. So there's a junctional region where the temporal lobe attaches to the inferior and posterior part of the frontal lobe. It's there that we find this division that we call the piriform cortex. So this illustration perhaps is just a bit too generous indicating 
a more medial and uh, perhaps a more ventral position of the piriform cortex, but most of the piriform cortex is actually tucked underneath this little region where the temporal lobe joins the frontal lobe. Well, that leaves us with the rest of this medial uh, parahippocampal gyrus, and that's where we find the cortical divisions of the amygdala and the entorhinal cortex, which receive the inputs from the mitral cells of the olfactory bulb. Well, now that you have a bit more information about where the olfactory cortex is present, I want to make just a couple of general points about the organization of these olfactory structures that are worth noting as we discover this anatomy. First of all, I want you to notice that there is no thalamic relay between the sensory structures that we might consider to be more peripheral, such as the olfactory bulb, and the cortex. Now, in all of the other sensory systems that we've evaluated so far, uh, you'll recall that there is a nucleus of the thalamus that receives ascending or incoming sensory information and projects that information into cortex. And this, we think, is, is quite important for how these sensory systems operate. The thalamus is something of a gatekeeper to the flow of incoming sensory signals to the cerebral cortex. Well, this doesn't seem to be the case in the olfactory system. There is a connection to the thalamus, but it happens after information has been processed in the cerebral cortex. So there is no obligatory thalamic relay between the olfactory bulb and the olfactory cortex. So the second point worth highlighting is that as we detail the organization of the cortex itself and consider the topic of sensory coding, what will be very clear is that there is no known map of the sensory environment. And there may not even be a clear map of the sensory periphery at the level of cortical processing. Now there are very precise rules that help us understand how our sensory cells are related to specific neurons in the olfactory bulb. The, the challenge in understanding olfaction is that those rules are not conserved as the olfactory bulb projects back into the olfactory cortex. So at least no one has yet uh, demonstrated in any compelling fashion that there is something like a topographic map of the sensory environment in the olfactory cortex in the way that we've seen it for a body map in the postcentral gyrus, a map of the retina or the visual environment in the occipital cortex for vision, or even a map of tonotopy or a map of the basilar membrane in the auditory environment. So it's as if the rules of coding seem to be different in the olfactory system, and that makes it uh, very much worth exploring and understanding.